Let's well, hope the technology works well. And um, if you all can also help me kind of monitor the, the chat room, if we get any questions in the chat or if anybody raises their hand, that would be great. All right, actually it went one too far. So yes, as Dr. DeMiro said, this is our topic for tonight, critical race theory. And we're gonna do really just the basics in terms of what critical race theory is, where it came from or how it got started and why we're arguing about it. Why is there so much controversy about it right now? And I wanted to start with a video because I think the video kind of gives the introduction to it a little bit better than I can. So we'll watch the video first to get us started. Let me share my sound here. Okay. You're teaching children to hate others because of their skin color. Critical race theory was once an obscure academic concept. Now, as students head back to school, it's a fixture in the fierce U.S. debate over how to teach children about the country's history and race relations. Conservatives have invoked the term to denounce curricula and policies they deem too liberal. This was supposed to be a routine school board meeting in Virginia. Instead, it was pandemonium, as hundreds of parents flooded the auditorium. Critical race theory is anti-white, and it's not American. Let's roll back the clock to unpack what's happening. Critical race theory, or CRT, is an approach to studying U.S. policies and institutions that is most often taught in law schools. Law professors in the 70s began exploring how race and racism have shaped American law and society. The theory rests on the premise that racial bias, intentional or not, is baked into U.S. laws and institutions. The term gained a foothold after the murder of George Floyd in May 2020. Individuals and institutions began grappling with how racism persists in modern-day American society. In September 2020, conservative journalist and researcher Christopher Rufo went on Fox News to decry the anti-bias training happening in federal agencies as an example of critical race theory. Shortly after, President Donald Trump's administration directed federal agencies to cease such training, calling it, quote, divisive un-American propaganda. Why did you decide to do that? They were teaching people that our country is a horrible place, it's a racist place, and they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm no not going to allow that to happen. Vice President Biden? Nobody's doing that. He's just, he's oh, you, racist. You, you just have President Joe Biden has since overturned that executive order. In the year since Trump's executive order, conservative politicians, parents, and right-wing media have deployed the term to denounce discussions of racism, white privilege, or diversity initiatives in U.S. public schools. Remember that school being bombarded by parents in Virginia? Scenes like this happened across the country. My youngest looks very nice. So they would look at her and say, you are an oppressor. I just, I don't see how that's productive. I don't see how it's accurate. And I don't see how it's not going <laughs> to cause society to move further apart. Would you not teach what happened during World War I or World War II or the American Revolution? No, you wouldn't. We need critical race theory because we need real history. At least eight Republican-led states have passed legislation restricting how the concept of race can be taught. In Tennessee, a new law was passed in May that dictates lessons cannot make students feel, quote, discomfort, guilt, or anguish because of their race or sex. Public school districts across the U.S. in liberal and conservative counties alike have insisted that they do not teach the theory. Reuters spoke with two Tennessee teachers who say they and some of their colleagues are unsure how to teach accurately about slavery and other painful chapters of American history without violating the new law. All right, so as I said, we use that video to just give us the introduction, kind of the overview of what critical race theory is and what some of the controversy has been. So 
Let's go into some of that information in a little bit more detail. So as you see on this slide here, critical race theory, and as they said in that video, was developed by legal scholars of color back in the 1970s and the 1980s. And these scholars were trying to figure out how, you know, with all of the civil rights victories of the 1950s and 60s, including legislation that was passed during the 1950s and 60s and court cases that occurred, how were there still racial disparities in the United States? How could racism and that racial divide still be so large after they'd won so many victories? And so they started critically analyzing those laws and those legal cases to try to understand what happened, what went wrong, right? So that's what we have up here. They try to understand why those racial inequalities persisted despite the victories of the civil rights movement. So um, critical race theory tries to explain how racism is bigger than just individual acts of prejudice and discrimination. And I think, and we can talk about this some more this evening, but People often get caught up in that and they get uh, sort of sidetracked and they wanna see racism and discrimination as an individual problem, right? Racist people or a racist person is the problem or you know, we can label people and, and it's evil, it's bad to be a racist person. But what the critical race theorists were saying is that that's really not the issue. The issue is larger systemic racism and how racism is actually embedded into our um, social institutions, including the legal system. So one of the goals of critical race theory is to investigate, or it was when it originated, the goal was to investigate the role of US law in perpetuating racism. How could these laws, and people wanna say, oh, the law is neutral, right? And that's what we think of our justice system that um, you know, we stick to the letter of the law and that uh, racism shouldn't be a factor, but that's what the critical race theorists were arguing is, no, it still is, that the law really is not neutral. So that it's the critical race theorists and critical race theory is really asking the question, how do we analyze laws and policies and practices here in the United States, in our institutions, through a critical lens, right? How do we look at it through the critical lens of race? So some of the originators of critical race theory, Derek Bell is uh, sort of lovingly called the godfather of critical race theory. And you see there, um, probably his best known book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. And I remember when this book came out, I was towards the end of graduate school or had just finished graduate school. I think I was probably doing my postdoc um, when this book came out, right? And everybody was talking, at least within the black community, a lot of us were talking about his book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. But Derek Bell actually started writing some of the first articles that then sort of evolved into critical race theory back in the late seventies and the early eighties. And he um, was a civil rights lawyer. And in fact, in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, Derek Bell was one of the attorneys who fought um, many of the cases to implement that ruling. You know, Brown versus Board of, uh, Brown versus Board of Education was about um, desegregating the schools, right? It made racial segregation in the public school system in the United States essentially illegal. And there were many cases that came in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education. Derek Bell is one of the attorneys who fought and won many of those cases. And when it got to the 70s and the 80s, he became kind of disillusioned, right? Again, he was looking around, especially when it came to desegregating schools. He said, you know, we won all these battles and we did all these things to try to desegregate schools. But essentially, schools are still segregated, right? Because the implementation of those laws and those legal cases um, didn't have the desired effect that public schools still ended up pr pretty much being separate and unequal. So with his, in his disillusionment, that's when he, 
you know, started to question and started to critically analyze some of these laws and these legal cases. The other name on that list that some of you probably heard is Kimberly Crenshaw, because uh, she wrote one of the more common books right now about critical race theory, which is really an edited volume. And it includes many of the original articles, including by Derek Bell and the other people on that list that helped to shape critical race theory. So they are all legal scholars. Now, since then, critical race theory has been applied in other fields, such as education, political science, sociology. But it really was what some people call um, like uh, a philosophy or an intellectual analysis of, you know, again, these laws and these legal cases and these policies. It's not something for the everyday consumer. It really isn't. So it's interesting how it's sort of become this big controversy within K through 12 education. But here's some other points about critical race theory. Again, it was really more of an academic framework, uh, a way of analyzing or approaching these cases that argues lady justice is not blind, right? Our pictures of lady justice, our statues like the one in this picture, she has a blindfold on because justice is supposed to be blind. But what the critical race theorists argued was that justice is not blind that the legal system in the United States was built on this idea of white supremacy, meaning that um, whites had the power and wanted to keep that power and maintain that power. And that the legal system was a tool, a method for doing that. And they also talked about how there are structures in US society that create these racial disparities that result in the disparities we see in economics, in housing, in education, healthcare, et cetera. So again, this idea that laws are supposed to be neutral and um, the critical race theorists even criticized the liberal legal scholars because they said a lot of liberal legal scholars use the colorblind philosophy. Again, that idea, well, the law is colorblind. The law doesn't see color, but the critical race theorists argued, no, that is not true. That racism and, and racist ideas are actually built in to, again, our legal system, our other social institutions. So here's some examples of such laws, policies, and procedures that some of you have probably heard about. So for example, redlining and gerrymandering. Many of you, excuse me, are probably familiar with those terms, but redlining was a practice where they went on maps and actually drew lines around different neighborhoods and made policies. Literally, you know, in the beginning it was black people or other people of color cannot live in these neighborhoods. We will not sell houses to people in these neighborhoods. Well, yes, laws were passed to make that illegal, but then the practice still continued sort of informally, right? With real estate agents just not showing people homes in those neighborhoods and with banks charging blacks and other people of color highest inter higher interest rates or actually refusing to give loans. And we all know that um, home ownership in the United States is one of the key components of wealth and building wealth here in the United States. So when you make it more difficult or even um, eliminate certain people from being able to own homes that has a big effect and that influences the disparity, right? Not just in housing, but also in economics and in other opportunities that people have. So I have a short video here about redlining to show how it's still impacting us today, even though it was um, made illegal, but how it still impacts us. So let's watch this one. Since the 1930s, neighborhood racial composition has been used to determine home value. The practice, often called redlining, started with color-coded maps. These maps were outlawed in 1977, but appraisers continued to value homes based on racial demographics. Even today, appraisers evaluate homes in white neighborhoods as worth considerably more than comparable homes in Black and Latinx neighborhoods. This is true even when researchers compare neighborhoods with similar socioeconomic status, real estate demand, and historical redlining practices. In fact, the gap between white communities and communities of color has doubled since redlining was formally outlawed. 
This has resulted in white neighborhoods appreciating $200,000 more since 1980 than comparable black and Latinx neighborhoods, which has exacerbated racial inequality in education, employment, health, and wealth. Addressing this inequality requires transforming contemporary appraisal practices and rectifying historical injustices. All right, so I see the comment in the chat that, uh, so Elaine, are you saying that redlining is not a good example? You said it's it's very complex. Is that what you were referring to? No, I, uh, Dr. Barker, I think she was referring to uh, the comment before, which is justice is not blind, for example, Wisconsin versus Rittenhouse. Oh, oh okay, all right. Yes, it's interesting that you bring up um, Rittenhouse and I see, um, Beth, you were commenting on, on the Rittenhouse case, because I have that example here in the list in terms of self-defense and stand your ground laws, right? So we know that came up recently with the Rittenhouse case, um, where that was his defense, right? That first of all, he traveled from his home across state lines because he wanted to help defend and protect businesses. Um, from being uh, looted, you know, from being uh, harmed by the protesters. And uh, he also said, you know, that the protesters attacked him and so he felt he had to defend himself. And that defense was successful. We know that George Zimmerman, um, who killed Trayvon Martin back in 2013, 2012, 2013, that, um, he also was found not guilty because he used the same defense, right? By saying, well, I felt threatened um, when he had a gun and Trayvon Martin did not have a gun. And many times you see the same defense used for police officers um, and others. All they have to say is that I felt my life was in danger. And so if you look at these cases, again, that defense is more successful when it's a white person using that than when it's a uh, a person of color, especially a black person using that defense. So these are some examples of how such laws and policies and procedures, even though we say again, well, justice is blind, these things are done equally, but when you really look at the patterns and the trends, we see that um, these things serve to perpetuate these disparities and to, you know, keep these gaps going between the races on in all of these areas, right? In wealth, in housing, education, et cetera. So that's some of the background about critical race theory and where it came from, how it got started. So why are we talking about it today? As you saw, it was something that started back in the 70s and the 80s, and it was something very specific to legal scholars. Like, law students learn about critical race theory. And as I said, it did expand to other areas like education, political science, sociology. But even then, it's something that's taught in grad school. Very rarely um, is it taught even at the undergraduate level because it is something that's very high level and it's very complex. It wasn't made for the everyday consumer and it definitely wasn't made for K through 12. So why is it that critical race theory all of a sudden was being talked about. I saw some number that within a certain period of time, like on Fox News, they said critical race theory like more than 1,500 times. Um, so how did it become something so controversial? Well, it really started back in 2019 when the New York Times published the 1619 Project. And the 1619 Project was something that was spearheaded by Nicole Hannah-Jones and what it was is they were documenting the history of slavery in the United States and the legacy of slavery and how throughout the history of the United States, we are still living with the impact of more than 400 years of slavery on this continent or in this hemisphere. And so that was published in 2019. And then after that in 2020, George Floyd was murdered by police officer Derek Chauvin. 
And we all saw that video, the very graphic video over and over again, and it sparked protests where literally millions of people took to the streets protesting the murder of George Floyd, um, protesting in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And you had protesters again around the world who were bringing attention to this issue of police brutality and racism in policing. And what happened is, you know, because this was part of the discourse, not just here in the United States, but across the globe, family members are struggling. How do we talk to our children about this? Teachers in the schools were struggling. How do we talk to our children about what happened to George Floyd? In response to pretty much both the, the um, 1619 Project and a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of George Floyd, Donald Trump signed a bill banning diversity training in all federally funded institutions. Many of you probably remember that. And what he did is he created his own commission, right? His sort of counter to 1619 project. And he established the 1776 commission. And on his website, I took a quote off of his website, um, what he said regarding why he established the 1776 commission. So Trump said he did it to restore understanding of the greatness of the American founding. And as a rebuttal, of reckless re-education attempts that seek to reframe American history around the idea that United States is not an exceptional country, but an evil country. So he directly said, you know, I'm creating the 1776 Commission because, you know, of this miseducation that's going on in the schools right now where we're teaching children that America is a racist country and that America is an evil country. And, we have to teach our children that, you know, America is great, right? So that's Trump in 2020 with him establishing his, establishing his 1776 commission. Um, but when Biden became president, one of his first acts in office was to ban, uh, well, he reversed Trump's ban on diversity training in um, federally funded institutions. So that was one of the first things that Biden did when he became president. And now in 2021, as of the last number I saw was on November 21st, so just a couple of weeks ago, nine states had passed legislation to regulate classroom discussions on racism and critical race theory and counting. There are other several other states who have um, pieces of legislation in the pipeline to try and do the same thing. And you have many um, school districts across different states that have also passed similar bans where they're saying in classrooms, K through 12 classrooms, you cannot talk about racism. And what people should know too is that many of these bans also include gender. So they're saying that in the classroom, you can't talk about racism, you can't talk about sexism, you cannot teach those things in the classroom. So I have an example here of a school district in Pennsylvania and um, some controversy that was sparked there around banning books. So let's uh, take a look at this one. Do you think the adults that banned these books have read these books? Absolutely not. No, no definitely not. Absolutely not. Because I don't think a moral compass could let you ban books that say Correct. equality and loving each other. These teenagers in York, Pennsylvania, are standing up to the latest example of controversy surrounding history and race that is affecting a growing number of America's public schools. The school board cannot just silence our voices. Last fall, the all-white school board of the Central York School District unanimously banned a list of educational resources. And that resource list, which has a lot of bad ideas and some books that I would definitely not want in our district. And I do not feel it's balanced, it's balanced and I think it's divisive. That list includes a children's book about Rosa Parks, Lala Yousafzai's autobiography, CNN's Sesame Street Town Hall on racism. Racism? What's that? And much, much more. This is hidden figures. I don't, uh, the movie was, you know, a... Uh, uh, like from the movie? Yeah. yeah. So the, the kid's movie. version of the book from the movie? Yeah. yeah. 
it's frustrating for the students. This is a board that after hearing their students' concerns about diversity in the district, hearing my struggles with race being an Indian American and, and co consistently feeling like I didn't belong, after all those conversations for weeks on end, they still pursued this book, book ban. I want to learn genuine history. I don't want to learn a whitewashed version. I want to hear all of it. I don't want to I don't want everyone to be worried about how we feel because no one was worried about how BIPOC um, members of the community felt. The ban caused school librarians to pull books from shelves and is creating real fear among educators. I have to now, with this resource ban, think twice about whether or not I should or could use a James Baldwin quote as an opening for my class. There are teachers looking over their shoulders, wondering if someone's gonna be at their door, darkening their door, that you said something or you mentioned something or you used something that you were not supposed to. The fact that all the banned materials are by or about people of color is just a coincidence, according to the school board president. Concerns were based on the content of the resources, not the author or topic, she said in a statement. She and the rest of the school board refused to speak on camera. She says it's not a ban. The materials are frozen while the board vets them. But the process is still ongoing after nearly a year. That suits some parents in this 82% white district just fine. I don't want my daughter growing up feeling guilty because she's white. That sentiment is spreading. At least 27 states have passed or are considering policies strictly defining what students are allowed to learn about race. One expert says the York ban is something new. And yeah, this seems pretty egregious. I mean, I can see how certain um, trainings or workshops that some parents take exception to seem really outside of what a history class can be expected to do. But the kind of texts that are being banned here make me feel that there is now just sort of an allergy to anything that mentions race or racism. This is about more than a book or a movie or even a curriculum, some veteran teachers say. In York, they worry it's a war on their profession. I am not an enemy of the state. That's right. I am here to take care of your babies when they walk into That's my right. classroom. And there are some I'm looking up at, but they're still babies. Boy, oh boy, Evan McMorris Santoro joins me now. I mean, it, it's, this is ridiculous. It's outrageous. Thank you for that piece. It's really great reporting. This seems really broad. What was the issue with seeing in Sesame Street Town Hall on race? Well, Don, that's the question those students in the piece were asking, parents are asking, teachers are asking, and I asked several times while I was in York. Uh, but the board will re refuse to talk about the specific things that they don't like with things like Elmo asking about race or a Rosa Parks biography or the 2017 Academy Award winning best documentary feature. Uh, people who are watching this, watch this issue nationally, say this York situation could present a new front in this battle in which anything that centers non-white people, their experiences, their lives, their history, could be suspect. And they say that's a very, very scary thing to think about. Don? Yeah, let's rem remember, as they say, there's no systemic racism. That was sarcasm, Evan, by the way. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the reporting. A very, very scary thing indeed to me, and I'm not sure, we'll talk about this. I'm, I'm going through the material and then we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A, but this is not just in York, Pennsylvania. I will say subsequent to this uh, newscast that the school board in York, Pennsylvania did reverse the ban um, because they're in large part because of those students and those parents who were protesting um, but this is something that's going on across the country. I hope you all know that book banning actually goes on all the time uh, that we may not know. The, um, the Library Association in the United States, sorry, I'm forgetting the National Library Association, American Library Association, thank you, um, publishes a list every year of books that have been banned in schools. So this is something that we think really in a, in a free democratic society, we're banning books. Isn't that something that happened historically in, in fascist regimes? Isn't that what happened? But it's something that's going on right now. So something that uh, I think we really need to 
pay attention to and really be concerned so about. about so let's clear this up here. Critical race theory was never meant to be taught in K through 12 schools. In fact, it's not taught in K through 12 schools. As I explained a minute ago, it's something that is taught in law school and other graduate programs. It's rarely taught at the undergraduate level and it is not taught in K through 12. So, when you see like in the very first video we watched this evening where you see these angry parents showing up at school board meetings saying, don't teach critical race theory, it actually makes no sense because the schools are not teaching critical race theory. What they're really saying is don't talk about racism. Don't talk about race in the schools. As you saw in that video about the book banning, don't talk about anything that might be a little bit controversial. Don't talk about Rosa Parks sitting down on, on the bus. I saw a meme the other day. I tried to find it to put in the presentation, but I wasn't able to because um, it had gone by in my Facebook feed somewhere. But some of you may have seen it about Ruby Bridges, right? You know, Ruby Bridges is the, the little African-American girl who integrated the schools, you know, during school desegregation back in the 50s and 60s. And um, it said, you know, the people who kept Ruby Bridges out of school now don't want their children to know that they kept Ruby Bridges or didn't want Ruby Bridges to come to school. So it's really two different things, but critical race theory has just become the boogeyman, so to speak, or the, the hot term, you know, that gets thrown out there to get people fired up and get them upset, something for them to rally around, um, you know, their rally cry, like critical race theory, don't teach it to our kids, when it actually makes no sense at all, because K through 12 doesn't teach critical race theory. Again, the real issue is in the K through 12 schools is about, do we teach the role that racism has played in US history? So again, why all the controversy? It sort of breaks down as many issues do these days in our very partisan divided country right now. It really breaks down to between conservatives and liberals very loosely, right, if we wanna generalize. So on the conservative side, people are saying, well, a focus on race actually causes divisions and it worsens, worsens race relations. Like you saw the one father in that very first video saying, well, my daughter is biracial and she looks white. I don't want her growing up thinking she's the oppressor, right? Or what Trump was saying is, you know, when you teach critical race theory in the schools, you're teaching white people that they are the oppressor, you know, teaching that all white people are evil and bad and, and black people are the, the victims. Well, I hope you understood that's actually not what critical race theory is about. Critical race theory is not talking about individual people. Remember I talked earlier about how that's a lot of times how people get distracted. They're focusing on individual people being labeled as racist when that is not what critical race theory is about. Critical race theory is about systemic racism. It's about institutional racism. It's about how racism or, or issues of race are embedded into our social institutions here in the United States and how those laws and policies and practices result in continued inequities between the races. That is what critical race theory is about. Um, so it, it's, it's not really about creating more divisions between us. It's actually, how do we solve, right? How do we understand these issues and how do we rectify them? How do we solve them? So on the conservative side, they're saying, don't talk about race. It makes things worse, right? Whereas on the liberal side, again, it sort of loosely falls along these lines. Um, liberals tend to say, well, it's a mistake to forbid discussions of important societal issues. Our children need to learn about these issues. And again, in that first video, you saw the father who was against it. And then you saw the woman who was saying, no, we need to, we need to teach about this history. And then you saw the students 
who were protesting the book ban in Pennsylvania, saying we want to learn. We don't want a sanitized version of our history. We want to know the real history. And I'm sure all of you know that saying, you know, those who don't learn their history are doomed to repeat it. Okay, so here we go with a question and we can get our discussion started here. Um, actually, I'm gonna show one more slide because then I'm going to um, stop sharing my slides and I'm gonna uh, go back so we can all see each other's faces as we discuss. But I see something in the chat here. Let me see if I get caught up. Um, Beth and Jeff said, liberals, it's not merely a mistake, rather it's incumbent that anti-racism be taught, discussed and understood as a pathway, pathway to ending injustice, violence and systemic oppression. Yeah, so I think again, we can loosely break it down along these lines, but yes, that's what Beth and Jeff said. That is the sign that's saying, we can't bury our heads in the sand. You know, we can't pretend that justice is blind or that we're all colorblind, that the only way to overcome these issues is for us to bring them out and put on the table and talk about them. So let me just share this last slide here and then we will open it up for discussion. Here in this, I have the, the picture of Kimberly Crenshaw's book. This is the one where I told you um, she has edited it and compiled together some of those original and uh, seminal writings on critical race theory in this book. So it's, it's a little dense, as I said, because these are all legal scholars who are writing from that perspective. So even when I was reading it, man, it, I was having, it was taking me a long time to go through each paragraph to really understand it. I'm marking and making notes and everything. So. Uh, even this book is really not for the everyday reader. There's another one. Um, I think it's actually called Critical Race Theory Made Simple or something like that. So there are some others that are a little more user friendly, but um, this one is the one that kind of documents the history, the origins of critical race theory. So what is it really all about, this controversy that we're having? It's really not about critical race theory specifically. It's more about power and control. As I mentioned, it's critical race theory is just the latest issue being used to divide our country, to try to decide who's going to have power, who's going to control the future, who controls the information. Um, so that's really what it's about. Right, one, one side creating these divisions in order to uh, maintain power or to exercise or flex their power. So what's one of the takeaways I hope we get from this evening? Again, we're gonna get our discussion started, but um, is to educate yourself and others about the real issues, right? So I hope that now, again, this was just a, a real brief primer about critical race theory and trying to understand what the true controversy is about so that when you hear people getting into these debates about it, well, critical race theory, they shouldn't be teaching that to our kids. Well, the answer is they're not. It's not being taught to kids. What you're really saying is don't teach kids about the history of racism or the role that racism has played in the past and the present of this country, right? Again, I said part of it started because teachers were struggling with how to talk with kids in the classroom about what happened with George Floyd. So educate yourself, understand what the real issues are and then act accordingly, right? Then make your decisions, then decide where you stand on these issues. All right, let me stop sharing my screen and uh, let's open it up for discussion. Let me see, I see um, 